Hey everyone, welcome back to Obscura Lupa Presents. Y'all remember Kazam? Yeah, yeah, green eggs and ham it. But to me, this movie means... Well, not much, actually. I haven't seen it since it came out, but I liked it as a kid. However, let's be honest, child me had horrible taste in movies. I still do, but I've become self-aware. It's a technique that has saved me on many occasions. Oh, the time before. All the dark, lonely nights. Nothing but Kazam on the television and the company of tears. The time I wasted. Gone. Into a dark abyss. Anyway, you ever wondered what Kazam would be like if it weren't completely insulting to your intelligence and also British? Well, then you'd have Bernard and the Genie, a movie starring Alan Cumming, Rowan Atkinson, and Lenny Henry. Cumming is Bernard Bottle, whose life sucks until he meets a 2,000-year-old genie who helps him solve all of his problems. And it's a Christmas movie. Ta-da! I couldn't believe this was a Christmas special. It was like the idea was tailored exactly to my needs. You tell me any movie is a live-action comedy about a genie, and generally I'm all aboard. But this one was Christmas-themed, and I had to get my hands on it. This was a TV movie from 1991, and so far the only official release has been on VHS. And I have no idea why, because, come on, it's a Christmas comedy about a genie. Brilliant! Let's green eggs and ham it. The film starts as most Christmas movies do, in the desert somewhere. Josephus here has just finished his first booking as a knife thrower, which resulted in stabbing this man's daughter in the throat. I'm serious, there was no joke there. He just brutally stabbed a woman in the neck. Um... So you're gonna start out your wacky, genie Christmas comedy with violent murder, huh? Not really the approach I'd take. Okay, so this guy is kind of pissed about his daughter being killed, so he sentences Josephus to becoming a genie. So, let me get this straight. This is a punishment, correct? Giving him almost infinite power? And if this guy's got the ability to do that, then why didn't he just save his daughter? We see later in the movie that genies can time travel. Surely this inexplicably powerful dude can finagle something. I just don't see how he got from point A to point B here. It's a totally not awkward tonal shift! We're introduced to Bernard as he's being driven to work, riding off of the success of an art sale that got his company 50 million pounds. His boss is Charles Pinkworth, played by Rowan Atkinson as if he were a very douchey Abe Lincoln. Who speaks in Old English? I'm sure it made sense at the time. City, city, takey, takey. Here's Bernard's fatal flaw. He's just too nice of a guy. That, coupled with the fact that everyone around him is cartoonishly evil, means that he often gets the short end of the stick. As seen here, when he reveals that he promised the old ladies he bought the paintings from half of the money he made back if they turned out to be valuable. I suck ye. I want you and your philanthropic little ass out of this building pronto. Oh, I'll have you arrested for loitering and probably throw a charge of sexual harassment into the bargain. I write to warn you against employing a Mr. B. Bottle, whom I've just caught attempting to steal 25 million pounds from me. He has just left my office, and suddenly, my gold fountain pen has disappeared. P.S. I've just dropped in on my secretary, who looks distinctly harassed. Sexually. Aw, now that's just mean. What does he need another dude's suspenders for? Come on. Exactly the same thing happened to me. I used to work for this big oil firm. I discovered the formula for a new kind of petrol. Cleaner, cheaper, more efficient, kinder to the environment. Handed it in, the next day they fired me. I never saw a penny of the profits. Is that true, Keppel? No, sir, it's not. Not true? No, sir, it's a total lie, sir. I thought it might cheer you up. That's Keppel. He does that. So after a miserable day, things can't get much worse for Bernard. And by that, I mean he catches his girlfriend sleeping with another man, she leaves him for his best friend, and she takes all of the stuff in the flat. Oh come on, she needed just the lampshade? What the hell was she going to use it for? And to top it all off, he finds a magical lamp and it blows up in his face, sending him to the hospital. What happened? Seems to have been some sort of explosion, sir. Merry Christmas! Thank you, sister. 
Okay, now that's just negligent. Also, why did the doorman follow him to the hospital? There are lots of great moments with Keppel, though. Too many for me to repeat here without coming off redundant. But I will say this. Every character in this movie, no matter how small, is important in some way. I never felt like anyone went so far from reality that I didn't care about them. And that's a sign of good acting and direction, especially in a comedy. Speaking of which, I'm fairly certain there's a genie in here somewhere. <laughs> This is terrifying! So he knows he's a genie, and he immediately tries to kill the first person he sees? I'm seriously doubting that knife-throwing accident was an accident at all at this point. Our genie is a serial killer, people. Merry Christmas! Oh, Lord of mercy, I wish you could speak English. I can't. Your wish is my command. Now, beware, old short one. You smell of peppermint, and it is time to die. And I wish you'd stop trying to kill me. Damn. Serial killer! Ah, attack of Ellen coming! I was in the blooming lamp! Yes, very likely. And how do large transvestites get inside lamps these days? Transvestite? He doesn't even look vaguely femmy. Stretching it, movie, and I know you haven't run out of good insults yet. It takes Bernard a while to believe that Josephus is, in fact, a genie, but he keeps making wishes, and that's a little bit hard to explain away. Apparently in this universe, you get unlimited wishes, and the genie just has to serve you forever. Which... Sounds awful until you realize you could wish for anything, pretty much, and that includes for the genie. Kind of a win-win situation. Good job punishing him, wizard dude. And no one cleaned this lamp in 2,000 years? How is it in such great condition? The movie does have some predictable gags where Bernard wishes for things he doesn't mean to and silly things happen, but surprisingly, it's usually not as predictable as you'd think. I mean, recall any genie plot you've seen, and usually you get the same sort of thing. The main character learns a lesson about what he should wish for, tries to get the girl of his dreams back, the bad guy gets the lamp and uses the genie for his own nefarious purposes. And it seems like this is what Bernard and the genie sets up, but then none of that happens. Which isn't to say it's written badly, I actually mean that it's kind of clever. Not only that, but it's actually funny. And I don't mean that like I usually do, it's genuinely a good comedy. Alan Cumming and Lenny Henry make great comedic foils. Two thousand years? Most of my friends will be dead. I know how you feel. My life hasn't been too rosy recently either. Getting teased a lot about this stupid haircut? No. The reason the comedy works is because this is also a good drama. Uh, sort of. You really feel for the plight of these characters because both of them have lost everything at this point. Both actors commit fully to their parts, so you never feel like they're being disingenuous, even though the situation is incredibly silly. It's what elevates this slightly above what the plot synopsis might lead you to believe. I know. I wish you weren't so depressed. No, it doesn't work. You can't change people's feelings with wishes. Oh dear. We're in trouble, aren't we? Let me remind you all, this is a Christmas comedy about a genie. And then there's the product placement. I wish we had two Big Macs. But da 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 I'm selling it. Okay, so it's not perfect, but the product placement works with the comedy, so I don't really mind it. All I ever wanted was to get out of the lamp. Now, I almost wish I hadn't. On the other hand, tell me, buddy, what color is this guy? Black. Thought so. And I will admit, they do go for the sort of obvious culture shock jokes. Bernard wishes for a few other things, including the Mona Lisa. This will become important later. He decides to take Josephus out to see the town. I don't actually have any transport. Well, you could just wish for a car or a flying carpet, whatever. Go the most subtle route possible. Are... are they dead? Bernard was sent to the hospital by a lamp earlier. I'm having trouble believing he made it out okay after that one. 
Anyway, after getting Josephus some new clothes, the two of them take a look around. This is mostly to include more product placement and culture jokes, so instead I'll talk a little bit more about why I liked this movie. Bernard isn't written like the usual protagonist in a genie plot. He does ask for some self-serving things, but he's not really a selfish character. In fact, he goes out of his way to make sure he's a good host for Josephus and treats him like a friend, when he could just as easily order him around and make him do whatever he says. The two of them seem on equal ground through the whole thing, so you buy their friendship pretty easily. The lesson here isn't about greed or wishes at all. It's about finding what you want in life. It's also about appreciating what you have around you already. Or, alternatively, there is no lesson, and you're just supposed to have a good time. Either way, I'm on board for that. Bernie, it's great to be here. There might be a little bit of a romantic subtext, too. Just a little. And the chap in the beard goes around with these flying reindeer, and then comes down chimneys and gives children presents. Wow! Yeah. And the pencil's also nice, isn't it? Yeah. Except, he doesn't, in fact, come down chimneys. And it isn't actually him who gives the presents. Do the reindeer really fly? I think not. Mr. Beardy is beginning to sound like a bit of a non-event. Hear that, kids? Santa isn't real! Yay! There is something to be said about his little speech here, if I can read into this a bit more than necessary. Saying that Santa isn't real, that kids don't get what they want, is Bernard basically echoing what his life is at the moment. Dreams don't really come true. Santa is a sad drunk at the shop, and everything is a disappointment. There's a bit of extra subtext to what's being said in this that really makes me appreciate the movie more. Well, I've sucked on some pretty wonderful things, Bernie, but that takes the biscuit. Oh, sweep him off his feet, you stallion. If Bernard isn't gay, he's certainly playing both sides. I can't not read into that. But there's also a subplot about him having the hots for one of Santa's helpers. This is mostly to set up more comedy bits, but again, this will become important later. I think your hair's quite nice. Bye. <laughs> it's been a long night for Bernard, so he decides to head home while Josephus checks out more of the city. This gives us time for some more heartwarming Christmas stuff. You're about to be accused of... Grand Theft. I just thought I'd pop around for a little Christmas drinky with my old pal Bernie and discovered this, dear lady. Pigs. Merry Christmas! So the basic motivation here is that Pinkworth knew Bernard had a list of more priceless paintings he could buy, so he went snooping around his place to find it. However, this scenario makes about as much sense as nonsense. First of all, the police don't question the fact that he was breaking and entering in the first place. Even if they bought his story about coming over for a drink, clearly Bernard can refute this pretty easily. Secondly, assuming they got permission to get into his apartment, why would the police be waiting in the dark for him to get home? They had the evidence they needed to convict him, all they had to do was post an officer at the door and arrest him when he got back. Yeah, he assaulted one of them because they were sneaking around like a bunch of creepers. And why are they collaborating with Pinkworth? Is there a reason he needed to be there? Just for the dramatic reveal or what? Oh well, at least things can't get much worse for Bernard. Deck the halls and all that. Crime, grand theft, and murder of a police officer. Really? Yes. He just killed a guy! This is so depressing! Should we be rooting for our main characters at this point? Both of them have at least one body on their hands now. I'm not sure if the audience was supposed to get a few yucks out of that one, but... <laughs> you sure got us by surprise, movie! Please be in there. Please be in there. Have the answer to all my dreams. Oh, genies, they so silly. Murder is hilarious. The police suspect that Bernard might have had an accomplice, so they head back to his flat to arrest Josephus. Um, under what grounds? You could bring him in for questioning, I guess, but they don't have any evidence that he was involved. Certainly not enough to book him. And why is Josephus so damn happy? He's either high as a kite or the most unaware person in the world. God, it's too depressing to explain. Even with a genie, I'm a disaster. The only girlfriend I'll ever get now will be six foot two with a full beard. Sounds okay to me. Oh, come on, be serious. I killed a policeman. He's king of the hill. He's top of the key. He's Mr. Unique. 
All right, this is actually played very well. You do feel sorry for Bernard, but I think he's kind of forgetting the whole magic genie thing. This can be solved pretty damn easily. If only I'd been there. I wish you had. <laughs> See? Told you. The same scenario plays out, this time without the murder or the arrest. What's going on here? You told us it was the Mona Lisa. What? They didn't even check to see what it was, or if there was even a painting before the dramatic light switch flip? They were creeping around in the dark, waiting to accuse someone of grand theft, all over one phone call? I want to know how the hell that conversation went. Hello. Apparently the painting has been returned. And they were calling him on Bernard's phone, why? When I'm so thrilled you're still alive. I'm so pleased I didn't kill you. And major conflict of the movie solved. Huzzah! Yeah, seriously, that was it. He wishes for the list back and Pinkworth slinks off somewhere else. And I know that sounds like the movie is going to meander around for the rest of the runtime, but remember, the story here is really about Bernard anyway. <laughs> my friend, I suspect this is going to be a very merry Christmas. <laughs> the movie didn't actually need a huge conflict. It's just a lot of fun to watch. Well, okay, there are still some plot threads to tie up here. The main one being Josephus missing his home and his family. Also, he knew Jesus, apparently. You did not. I did. What did he do to get so famous? Well, he turned out to be the son of God. No, I thought he was kidding. Yep, genies and Jesus. It happens. They have this oddly casual conversation about Jesus, like just some dude Josephus used to know. It's humorous, but it isn't presented in an insulting or heavy-handed way. It's really strange for a Christmas movie, but it's also pretty refreshing. Anyway, happy birthday, Big J. A crap businessman, but a great human being. So tell me what happened to him. Oh, he's crucified. I'm kidding. They've not. There's no need for that. But before we can get too caught up in religion, or what Jesus coexisting with genies and wizards means in the grand spectrum of things, the most awesome part of the film has to happen. Thank you. Here's the ticket. That's right. Bernard and Josephus take over for the crappy shop Santa and give the kids everything they ask for. That's so fantastic. But that's not the best part. I can't even describe what happens next. It'd just ruin the moment. Take it all in, folks. Fucking Leonardo! Check that shit out. I nearly crapped my pants when I first saw this. And that's actually the guy who played him in the first movie, folks. If any Christmas movie can top this, I'd love to see them try. Hats off to you, Bernard and the Genie. You are a Christmas miracle. Not mommy. Okay, now that's just got horrifying implications. So what did you wish for? To top off the feel-good train to Funky Town, Bernard wishes for Keppel to win three million pounds, gets his girlfriend and his former best friend arrested for possession of marijuana, sorry Colorado, and, in the crowning moment of nicest dickery in the world, wishes for Pinkworth to donate 100 million pounds to Christmas charities. Buckingham Palace apparently has received a 100 million pound charity check from you. You become a national hero because of your generosity. Have I? A knighthood is surely on its way. I wish it wasn't on its way. Is it? No, no, apparently it's not. That's sweet. Mark this, you ask away whatever it is, it's yours. I want to go home. Ah, back to heartwarming and sad, I see. You guys remember he's a genie, right? He could just go back and forth and... Ah, well, I guess this is forever. Bernard has gotten what he's wanted from life, and it's time for Josephus to get what he's wishing for. I love little Frank Carsten, and I love big Kevin Costner. I love post-it notes. I love you. Called it! Not only has Bernard learned a lesson, but Josephus has also figured out what's really important to him. The most epic Scotsman genie bromance of all time comes to a close, and the two friends have to say goodbye. Take it from me. 
It may not look like much, but it may come in handy when I leave. And when you're looking through that old Bible... Bible. Whatever. And it says, and the multitude gathered. Remember, one of them is a close personal friend of yours. Oh, this is getting far too emotional. I wish you'd just go. No, wait, I wish... I wish... Don't you dare make me cry, Bernard and the genie. Don't you fucking dare. It turns out Josephus gave Bernard a ticket to see the shop Santa, bringing him the courage to see the woman he liked and move forward with his life. And with the story coming to a close, we have one last issue to take care of. Um, that's, um, okay, you know your daughter's still dead, right? Forget the fact that bringing these things to the past completely changes history and life as we know it, but is Josephus even a genie anymore? If he stopped the wizard from turning him into one by making a deal with him, does that mean nothing in the movie ever happened? Is Bernard wallowing in an empty apartment or homeless by now? But Josephus couldn't make a deal if he hadn't been a genie in the first place, so then he... But then that means he... Oh, damn it, Bernard and the genie, you've created a paradox. Merry Christmas! This movie is so much better than it has any right to be. It may be a comedy about a genie, but it's surprisingly heartfelt and genuine. The humor actually works, and the acting is top-notch here. It may sometimes throw in a bit of mood whiplash, and the product placement is a bit hokey, but it never seems to lose itself. If you're looking for a new movie to add to your Christmas collection, I'd try to seek this one out. Now if they could just stop murdering everyone, we'd be all set. Merry Christmas! Two thousand years? Most of my friends will be dead.